Hi, Diola. Hi, Carol. Hi, everyone. I'll probably just give folks just another minute or two to get online, uh, just waiting for Dr. Nishrenko, and then we should be able to get started. <clears throat> Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started just because we have a, a short time frame and um, we have some really wonderful speakers today. Um, I'll go ahead by introducing myself. My name is Alicia Janiska. I am a pediatric emergency medicine physician. I work at uh, Hasbro Children's in Providence, Rhode Island, part of Brown University. And I am part of the Department of Pediatric Emergency Medicine, as well as Global Emergency Medicine and the Ultrasound Division. And I'm here with the co-chair of the um, GEMA subcommittee, uh, Pediatric Emergency Medicine subcommittee, Dr. Rebecca Leff. Dr. Leff, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you. So um, my name is Rebecca Leff. I'm currently one of the second year um, emergency medicine residents at the Mayo Clinic, and I focus on pediatric emergency medicine and global health, obviously, um, but specifically focus on pediatric care and humanitarian emergencies um, and pediatric emergency medicine development in low and middle income countries in the Middle East and North Africa. And it's really great to have everyone here. Great. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our distinguished panelists today. Um, these bios are brief and do not do them justice. Um, they are amazing, amazing people that I'm glad to call colleagues and friends. I'm starting off with Dr. Amber Hathcock. She is Pediatric Emergency Medicine at Advent Health. She was the prior director of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as Associate Director of Graduate Global Health Education at uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago. And um, she's currently practicing at Advent Health in Tampa, Florida, and her um, one of the countries that she specifically worked in is in Malawi. We have Dr. Adiola Kasoko, who is an associate professor. She is the um, former assistant residency program director and vice chair of diversity inclusion um, at the McGovern Medical School at the University of Texas in Houston. Uh, Dr. Kasoko now serves as the chief of academic affairs for pediatric emergency medicine at UT Houston. We are also joined by Dr. Carol Chen, who is an associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Chen serves as the medical director for pediatric emergency medicine at the Zuckerberg um, San Francisco General Hospital, as well as the co-director of the UCSF World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Emergency Critical and Operative Care. 
Um, I hope to be, uh, we will be joined by Dr. Michelle Nishrenko, who's an assistant professor at Boston Children's Hospital. She is the Grausbeg um, Fasalia uh, Global Health Director um, at Boston Children's Hospital with areas of interest in West Africa, the Middle East, Ukraine, and in India. And finally, we have Dr. Vinay um, Kampalath, who is a associate professor of pediatrics from the Perlman School of Medicine and works at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Kampalath is a research fellow at the Geneva Center for Humanita Humanitarian Centers, excuse me, Humanitarian Studies at the University of Geneva, as well as serves as a member of the International Pediatri Pediatric um, Strategic Advisory uh, Group on Children in Humanitarian Emergencies and has areas of focus with um, in Laos, Bhutan, and Bangladesh, as well as many other countries. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome for, um, um, on behalf of the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine, Global Emergency Medicine Academy. Thank you all so very much for being here with us today and sharing your knowledge with, with our future. Uh, Dr. Leff, I will hand it over to you. Yeah. Um, so. I was hoping to start with all of you describing what you do in the pediatric emergency medicine global health sphere. And maybe we could start with Vinay um, Kampala just to start talking about um, what he does in the PEM global health space. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And Alicia, thank you for giving me a promotion. I, I'm actually an assistant professor just started. So I, I appreciate the promotion. Um, so I primarily work in the humanitarian space and uh, also in um, developing uh, emergency care systems in low and middle income countries and resource denied settings. Uh, my, uh, my interest in global health um, kind of has evolved over the years, uh, primarily starting with uh, more developing, society, developing settings and then increasingly evolving to more humanitarian settings. Um, so I have worked clinically um, in humanitarian settings and increasingly um, kind of as a result of a pivot from during COVID working more in the research and policy space. Um, so I have actually, um, I haven't continued to work with the WHO and the global health cluster on um, some humanitarian health package um, policy and um, clinical work. Um, and then also have partnerships with um, folks at the Syrian American Medical Society and some universities in the UK. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Chen, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, so a lot of my interests have sort of evolved over time. I think right now I, I still do quite a bit of um, sort of medical education work in um, um, a lot in East Africa, but it just kind of depends on which areas um we uh we have partnerships with and are working with at that time but and i think um has evolved to um more recently working with our ucsf who collaborating center um for emergency critical and operative care um and a lot of what we do is sort of consult with the who on different projects um a lot of it could be educational tool, tool based or um, emergency care systems framework development or kind of implementation in other countries. So we kind of support a lot of the work that they do um, um, in kind of building emergency care, especially in settings that like, you know, lower and middle income countries that don't have it. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Hathcock, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, so I am a a little different position, but I can um, tell you because I haven't taken a global health hiatus up in the bit um, in Florida and doing more like local and advocacy work. But um, I will tell you my background is I work at um, Texas Children's Hospital with some of you guys who are attending. So it's good to see everybody virtually again. And Vene, I work with you in Barcelona, good to see you. It's really great fun. Um, and so I did a PEM and Joint Global Health Fellowship there. And during that time, I lived in Botswana and primarily in Malawi. Um, after finishing there, I did an academic position at University of Illinois at Chicago, like uh, Dr. Janeska mentioned. Um, and there I was, my unofficial title was Diversity Czar, but the official name was the um, Diversity um, Chair for, um, or the, excuse me, the Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, I also created and led for a while our um, graduate global health program, which is a two year longitudinal um, educational program for fellows, residents, and early career faculty to get some background in global health, learn more about like different options and careers in global health and learn some skills and get some hands-on um, experience working with um, 
other faculty from our university and some community leaders as well. Um, I ended up leaving like just after COVID to kind of take a hiatus, had to come home for it. Personal and family members. I'm still sort of involved in global health, so I can give you guys kind of a rundown on what to do when you're not attached to academics, um, which I did not realize was an option for a long time. But there are lots of good options if you're interested in global health and don't want to um, work academic all the time. Um, so through my work in Chicago, I built up a lot of interest in learning more about um, specifically white supremacy and racism and history of colonialism and how that pertains to a lot of our global health structures. Um, so I continue doing some research and some reading into that and working on some educational materials um, related to that. So thank you for sharing. And we, I'm sure we would all be interested in hearing more about how to not be an academic, because I know not all of us are interested in academics as well. Um, okay, and then also Dr. Kosoko, do you want to go next and share a little bit about your role in pediatric emergency medicine and global health? Sure, nice to um, see you all this afternoon and thanks for having me. Um, so I would put uh, what I do as essentially medical education um, with my um, target groups, uh, both clinically and, and academically, as well as uh, global, regarding global health, is for people who don't primarily take care of children, um, building capacity and increasing proficiency uh, in pediatric emergency care for people who um, don't primarily take care of children um, or prefer to take care of children. Um, and so the locations that uh, I have been working with for the past um, seven years um, is in Belize uh, with my partners, um, Dr. Janiska uh, and Dr. Mackey, working on um, building proficiency by creating curricula uh, and performing needs assessments, um, predominantly simulation-based um, uh, curricula. Uh, we've similarly done um, uh, projects for pre-hospital care providers uh, in Botswana. Um, uh, but that was prior to going to Belize. Belize is really my focus area as of um, current. Fantastic. And finally, Dr. Michelle um, Serenko, would you like to share a little bit about what you do in the PEM and global health space? Perfect. Thanks, guys. Apologies for my difficulty connecting. Um, it's great to be with you this afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Um, I would say I work mainly in large scale implementation. Um, I'm a programs person. I like to see things go. Um, and I'm my personal interest is mainly in the humanitarian context because as ER people, we like emergencies. Um, and so I've done some large scale implementation um, for Ebola, running national hospital emergency programs, post Ebola training and emergency care, and then moving into hospital, um, refugee hospital systems in the Middle East and looking at their ability to absorb surge and um, higher volumes. Um, similarly in India, combining that sort of operational surge capacity with um, education to improve hospitals and uh, sort of at-risk states in India. Um, and then uh, I have kind of long-term, so that's sort of worked all over um, in large programs. And then my like long-term thread is I've worked um, in Liberia where I actually am. So greetings from Liberia um, for the last 17 years um, and have ridden the different waves of humanitarian emergencies from the war to Ebola to COVID um, and then the development periods in between. So it kind of gives this interesting back and forth, unfortunate um, context, but uh, a wave of different sort of implementation programs. Fantastic, thank you. So maybe the, for this next question, I'll just kind of throw it out there and see who would like to answer first. Um, so as practitioners in global health and global emergency medicine, I think the biggest question a lot of us have is how do you fund your time? Um, and how do you go about your work um, in terms of funding? And so does anybody want to take that on that question first? Or I can. Oh, I can answer. So um, having done a little bit of both, I can tell you a lot of it um, currently is more self-funded, but there are lots of funding opportunities even if you're not academic. So there are a lot of um, charity organizations and NGOs and foundations that do support global missions. And so if you just look out for them, they'll have funding opportunities available and it doesn't necessarily, some of them are site specific where they are working already have a partnership with a certain site and so they are funded with supplements to go and work in that area. Um, but not all of them. So you just look around and keep your eyes open. 
Um, I will tell you when I was um, working for universities, I was lucky enough to have a job where there was a center for global health that was attached to our university. And so they carried some of their own funding and supplementation. So I think myself, especially coming out of training, I didn't realize how many um, non-academic options you have in general for Penn, just because my only exposure to medicine had been through academic centers throughout my training. Um, so university supplemented some, you also have like your CME money that some people will use that to help fund your trips as well. But again, there's lots of opportunities too for outside funding. If you just, just look around, keep eyes open, Google, well, there's some, um, uh, there's a couple of funding websites and now I'm blanking on the names of them that you can look at that kind of keeps a repository of, of possible grants and funding sources out there. Mm -hmm. And then maybe Dr. Kosoka, would you like to go next and talk about how you fund your time? Sure, I'm one of those people who have had their grant requests um, not <laughs> go through successfully on multiple attempts. Um, so, I mean, it's just the reality of, you know, uh, of the of the life, you know. So, multiple attempts at grants. Um, very few, um, very few people actually get these grants. And even with global health, there aren't huge grants available. But fortunately, um, I have a had a chairperson where when I came on faculty, um, we had negotiated that I would be able to use, um, to do global health. I wouldn't require, wouldn't be required to use my vacation time, which in of itself is a win. Um, and um, I would be allowed to use my CME funds um, to uh, be able to uh, fund the traveling expenses associated with the um, with uh, my work. The good news is um, the type of work that I'm doing uh, is meant to be uh, very uh, budget uh, friendly. So thankfully, it doesn't require uh, much uh, in terms of resources. Uh, but um, that's essentially what has gotten us through the entire creation of the curriculum, um, mostly using CME uh, and um, working with my schedule to get that done. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I especially appreciated discussing trying to work without funding as well, because that's part of that discussion. And when we don't have as much funding as we would potentially like. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Kampalas, would you like to share? Uh, sure. So I'm I'm not funded uh, as like a research faculty. I'm a clinical faculty um, presently. And so um, I have, um, I think, like the other panelists are, are mentioning, there are grant mechanisms to kind of help fund specific projects and specific engagements. I've had some success at being kind of a, a consultant or a subcontractor and some um, other larger grants. And I'm definitely looking more to that space to kind of develop um, develop a portfolio of work. Um, I've also had some success just through um, other opportunities that were actually fully funded that were wonderful. So um, I did go to Ukraine with um, Harvard last October. So that was a, a funded opportunity that was um, really helpful to defray the costs of lodging and, and travel. And so there are opportun opportunities like that that exist for more of a clinical or that was more of an educational engagement. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Dr. Chen, would you like to share? Sure. Um, so like many of you in academics, I think um, it is sometimes tough to get your chair or your chief or whoever you're dealing with to get to fund your stuff. So I think um, I, I just wanted to make a comment about that. I think one thing, you know, I think, you know, looking from a budgetary standpoint, you know, when you're sort of like like, you know, thinking from their point of view, like how, how to keep someone funded, you know, global health does not have returns, right? Like it usually doesn't come back to, to the department, to the vision. So I think um, trying to figure out how to make a case for it, um, you know, you have to kind of be a little bit creative sometimes in global health. And so one thing that I think, um, one strategy I wanted to share is to think about maybe putting like a temporary, like a short-term package, you know, pitch it to your chief or your chair to say, you know, if you give me three years, five years, whatever it is of this support for this time, and it gets you a little bit of time to look for funding elsewhere and maybe gives you a little bit of breathing room. So it's something that you could consider um, if, you're, if your department or division is in a position to negotiate that. 
So um, I totally agree with Amber. There's a ton of non academic money out there. I've got like grants from like LinkedIn and random other places. Um, I will say though, for UCSF, we, you know, there's a lot of, um, fortunately, a lot of internal grants for like say medical education projects um, in general. So um, that I've been able to get some funding in that way. But I do think, you know, um, having, having an initiative kind of, and I think Amber, you spoke to this a little bit too about like, um, you know, if your department or your vision is, um, you know, finds it a priority to fund global health, then, you know, having that will to kind of push things forward, I think is really important. Um, and that's one thing that I think I looked for in a place in terms of where I was going to go for a job, because you really need that will to push forward. Otherwise, you're kind of just paddling upstream the whole time, which gets tiring after a while. So, so I think, um, and I think, you know, having this W, you know, because because our department did you know, was able to get this this collaborating center with the World Health Organization. I think that also opens up some opportunities to apply for grant funding now that you sort of have this sort of um, multidisciplinary group of providers from, you know, from a, an academic institution like UCSF to kind of push in and to apply for money. Um, so those are kinds of the ways you can, it's, it, but I, I feel like for a lot of us, it's sort of like you're cobblestoning, you're just like cobbling it all together um, in, in, in little different ways. Fantastic. And then Dr. Nasirenko, would you like to share about how you fund your time? Yeah, so I, um, I would say um, in, in summary of kind of what the other speakers said and putting it together, um, money begets money. And so even if you get a little bit of money, you leverage that money to get more money. Um, and so we have to think a little bit less like doctors sometimes and more like finance people, um, which is hard because it's not our skill set. We're not trained to do that. Um, and so I think, you know, in the very beginning when I was a fellow and doing my global health fellowship time, I just said yes to every project that was funded that came my way because I figured I could learn something from it either a context, a methodology, an education, a topic area. So like, for example, thanks to Vinay for coming and teaching as part of our Ukraine project, we've deployed over 85 people to Ukraine across a number of cadres in the last year. Um, we had a similar um, emergency medicine project in India last year as well. And so, you know, if you can identify funded opportunities from other partners and academics through networking, from NGOs who often need to deploy people for different, um, you know, educational or clinical needs, um, you know, building relationships with those organizations, like, you know, you may go and be a two week foot soldier for a fill in the blank NGO and provide care or a four week person, but then you're a known entity. And that kind of gets you in the door when you give them feedback and say, you know, I noticed in your emergency program, you were missing this. Or have you ever thought about educating your staff on this? You know, as physicians from, you know, well-trained institutions, because all PEM programs are, are at well-trained institutions, so whether you're in the private sector or non-academic or academic, we all came from high-level training institutions. And so, you know, what we say does have influence, especially in the NGO community. And so you can often pitch projects to them. You know, it may not come immediately, but just building that network. And so, you know, from the end of my fellowship, I ultimately transitioned to grant funding um, from work during Ebola that just kept growing, 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 which then led to the next grant and the next grant. Um, I also, um, my role at the hospital is actually as the global health program director for our whole hospital. And so while we were building programming, we also had to build financing and funding. So this is an area that I actually find particularly interesting because I have to do it every day. Um, and so we really tried to diversify our strategy because like you guys, now I've got faculty in all the departments who need to fund their time. And so we've tried to diversify what grants we apply for. We've also moved big time into the consulting space. And so doing service contracts, you know, when you work for an NGO, it's often not a research project, it's a service contract uh, to deploy an educational service or a, an evaluation um, that can fund your time or can be banked up and your department chief or chair can use it over time. Um, we've also deployed philanthropy. So getting to know your hospital or your university's um, development or philanthropy people, um, you know, people come through asking, what do you do in this country or what do you do in this space? 
And so being an outlet for that is also really um, a good opportunity too. And so we've now built our, um, our work into endowments, which then give us long-term sustainability. Um, and so, so some of it was just the domino of just saying yes to everything um, and then kind of trying to strategically network um, around. And I know both you and um, Vinay also just spend a lot of time in the humanitarian space, as you mentioned. How do you think that differs in that space um, when you're trying to look for interventions for, for PEM in the humanitarian space in terms of funding? I actually think it's an easier space for funding because by definition, it's emergency. And so it's really not hard to make the case that children are victims of emergencies. Um, and so a lot of our work um, has been leveraged service contracts. So we did a large service contract for Ebola. We did a large Ebola recovery, Ukraine education for trauma, India education after COVID um, for surge absorption and ER function. Um, so if anything, it's been a little bit, um, a little bit easier. I, it does pose a challenge because emergency work is also by definition urgent. And so you have to have the ability to absorb the work immediately. And so you can't just like, you know, piece out of your department for four months if you have, with your chair, not expecting it, you definitely won't make friends that way. Um, and so, so it's a little bit of a push pull of figuring out, do you clump your shifts voluntarily and you build yourself free periods of time? Um, can you negotiate a two to three year starter package, which we've done with a number of our graduating global health track fellows is in their new institutions. We've negotiated like protected time for global health to get up and running um, and making a pitch to the chief and chair. You know, it's a great recruitment tool. I mean, right now PEM is, we fill every year mostly. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the coming one to two years. You know, emergency medicine didn't fill this year for the first time ever. So from the general EM world, the workforce change is real. I hope we don't see that, but we may. Um, and so having faculty who do global health, you know, link up to your pediatrics program or link up to your emergency medicine program that at your institution, because you become an att attraction for recruiting trainees and good quality trainees because people want this. Um, is another way to kind of sell it to the cheaper chair. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I don't know if um, uh, Dr. Kampal, if you wanted to comment on that before we moved on, but that was a really helpful transition. So our next No, question. I think, uh, yeah, no, I think Dr. Nishrako kind of hit on all the main points. And I think piggybacking off of something that she said earlier, really starting small and then kind of growing when you think about like think about your time horizon, think about sort of the first step and then the subsequent steps. I think that is sort of the best way to approach this kind of conundrum that we all face in academia. Yeah, and I'd say that, you know, humanitarian work, I think people can see intrinsically the value of it because of its urgent nature uh, in terms of uh, funding. Unfortunately, with education, as we see every day, it's a lot harder for some people to understand the value that might be intrinsic in that. And so to put money next to it is a bit, it takes a lot more finessing, I would say. Thank you. Um, so kind of thinking about, um, we were talking a little bit about training and thinking about how we move from fellowship into attending and how we use that space. Um, and so reflecting back, is there a time in your career that you felt vulnerable and what advice would you give for navigating that time, especially as it relates to being in this world of PEM and global health, which sometimes feels a little bit smaller than the EM and global health world? I don't know if anybody wants to start or I can just start going around the circle again. Um, well, Dr. Kosoko, would you like to start since you're on my screen? Sure. <clears throat> um, so I would say uh, even my pathway is a little bit different. Um, so to, regarding the question that you asked, I actually am um, board, uh, my primary board is emergency medicine. My mm -hmm. secondary board is pediatric emergency medicine. Um, so I did um, that fellowship in addition to a global health fellowship. Um, so 
Um, I would say it is not a path well taken. I haven't met any other me's uh, in my uh, global health um, in my global health uh, journeys because even with EM to PEM, there's what well, it's about twelve percent right now of us um, in the country. Um, so that being it, that in of itself, there aren't very many people who work in the space the same way I do, but that's part of the reason why I have the very specific population that I um, am more drawn to. I talk to people like myself, emergency physicians, who it's a byproduct of their job to take care of children. So how can we take care of children better? Um, and so my purview and my uh, mission is a bit different um, to not make you a pediatrician, to not make you a PEM physician, um, but to help you do this um, with a little bit more confidence um, and uh, competency. Um, so in terms of vulnerability, especially in the beginning of my career, it was simply every day wondering, how do you do this <laughs> and how do we how do you get with people who understand what you are trying to do? And thankfully, um, with my two biggest projects, both in um, Botswana and um, Belize, it was right place, right time to help quelch the how to, because everywhere else where I'm like, can I wiggle my way in here? It was very, I found it was a lot of resistance. It was very difficult. But the needs at the time were such that right person for the right job um, to speak to the right people. Um, but otherwise, what I would say the most vulnerable would, would be while I was trying to figure out where do I fit in um, and where are my services even needed? Do people even get what I'm trying to do? Um, but once you meet the right people, once you see that you actually have that, um, have a skill set that can contribute to that space, it, things work pretty naturally. So um, uh, I guess that would be when I felt most vulnerable. Thank you so much for sharing. I think as an emergency medicine resident going into a career in PEM and global health, I think I feel that um, I feel that a lot. And it was a big impetus for this webinar is to hear voices like your own. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Hathcock, would you like to go next and share um, what you know time in your career was the most vulnerable and how you navigated that time? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, I think that's great, great answer, Deal. I agree. It was um, definitely finishing training and then kind of figuring out, okay, like I was moving to a different institution. So how do I, like, what am I doing? <laughs> and how do I get into it? Um, I think Carol kind of mentioned this earlier that I, when I was looking for academic jobs, I looked for a place that was um, more on board with global health and more supportive of it. So you kind of select out in that sense. Um, I will say, just not to repeat anything else to deal with it, but I will say that another time I felt vulnerable was definitely recently, so switching out of academics. Um, again, just because my entire medical career up to the point has been tied to academic institutions, and so it's one of those, you're so used to it and you're so comfortable with the umbrella, and I knew and understood how to do global health under this academic umbrella with this university with, you know, like-minded people around me who were kind of doing the same thing, so how do you do that and function outside of that? Um, and so still going through it, but I can tell you it's, um, I mean, the answer is, as someone said to me recently, it was when you ask for advice from other people, they can only give you your perspective. They can't tell you what to do because you are the only you. Um, so I would say the biggest lesson I've taken from that, and I think applies in all situations, is that you just do what's right for you. I think we talked a lot about like right place, right people, right time. Um, global health is a small world. And as a small world, like the fact that I know most of the people on the screen um, <laughs> really speaks to that. Um, so I think it's a lot of it's a lot of networking, knowing people, even if you're changing institutions, changing jobs, you still have those partnerships and friendships you've built over time. So some of the other stuff that I've done from here, even though I'm more locally based, not traveling as much, has been from relationships I've built from the times I have been traveling. Um, or friends of friends who you know someone who knows I'm interested in this have gotten um, to be involved in actually a um, um, a couple of um, NGOs and smaller organizations that people started to work in Malawi just because they knew someone who knew me that, you know, knew that I worked there. And one of them is actually my, my aunt's friend who was like, oh, I know someone who finally lives in Malawi, whereas everybody always thinks I'm talking about Maui when I would say that I was going there and I thought I was going on vacation. So I'd clear that up every time. Um, and she was starting an NGO, wanted to work on um, 
helping with like outreach and clinics and, and pediatric health. And so I got to be a consultant with her and, and starting an organization of what did they need to do, who they need to talk to and how to get that started. So I will say that it very much, I mean, like all things in life, it's you do what works best for you. Um, I think don't put down any experiences that you've had, don't minimize it. I think in academics also and doctory people, because we're all type A, we tend to um, create our own imposter syndrome and make ourselves feel very small or like you're not doing enough. Um, and I would say that everyone's experiences are valuable and are adding value to yourself using your own expertise um, and don't don't downplay that. And that I think, like you said, builds over time and, and that's how you build your career. It's not like one big giant project. It's just step by step. Fantastic. That's such valuable words, just even for training in general as well, and trying to find, you know, the global health space in both the academic and non-academic space. So thank you for sharing. Dr. Chen, would you like to share? Sure. Um, you know, I just want to, you know, just, yeah, echo everything that's been said, but, um, you know, it's funny when you ask that question, a time when I've been vulnerable, you know, I'm not sure. I, I feel like I'm still vulnerable. I think it's always been, I kind of always feel that way. Um, it's not really just one time, but no, but seriously, I, I think, um, you know, it, it is hard, I think, you know, and it's a small space in PEM Global Health. Um, everyone does know each other. So, so I do think, you know, I know most of the people on the screen. So I thank you. Um, but, you know, also, I think, you know, your life and things change. And I think, Amber, you were sort of kind of getting at this, if I'm not wrong, but like, so, and, you know, doing what's best for you is always really important. So I think, um, you know, once you get somewhere, you, you'll figure it out and, and you'll see what's there. You know, you want to buy yourself some time and you want to give yourself some space to kind of figure it out. Cause that's always where you're going to feel the most vulnerable is when you're kind of like, starting somewhere. But I think if you give yourself some space and time and then see what happens. And I feel like over time, at least in my career, there've been, you know, yeah, there's been the right place, right time. But I think part of it's also just getting to know what's there, you know, cause you won't know if it's the right place, right time, if you don't know what's going on. So part of that's like kind of what Michelle was saying, you know, saying yes to things, making sure you get yourself involved. What Alicia was saying, Alicia was saying on the, on the chat, like about really just, just, you know, making sure you publicize what you're doing so people know you're in the space and they'll come to you for things and you'll become part of this community. So I think making you sure you do all of those sorts of things to kind of, you know, get yourself out there um, and see, I will, I will add one little thing, you know, say yes to things, but please also follow through and do them because I do get a lot of people, especially trainees who come to me who want to do things. And then it, doesn't quite all always happen the way you expect and it doesn't quite get the follow through. So just make sure you do that too. Um, and, and then you'll kind of feel your way around and, and figure out what's right for you. Cause it's not just your career and global health, but I mean, we all have personal lives too, right? Things change, priorities change. So maybe what you wanted in global health as a career is not going to look the same 10 years later as it did when you first started, you know, for whatever reasons in your life, be it personal or professional. So um, so those are just some of the thoughts I have, but, and, and I, yeah, just, just want to amplify everything that, that has already been said that, um, such sage advice, um, from everyone here. And you mentioned trying to kind of get a sense of what's going on, um, as part of that, what are other ways that you would suggest people go about that? Yeah, I think it's a good question. So I think, um, so, so I think, I think of it in two ways. One is like your own institution or, or place or wherever it is that you're working, right? Figure out what's going on with global health, just where you are. Sometimes this is in your division or department. And then it could also be more wide throughout your entire, if you're at an academic institution and university or wherever it is that you're working, figure out what's going on and what everyone else is doing. If you can try to meet up with people, find out. Um, see what programs are there already. And then I think also get involved on a larger level, like, um, you know, SAM, you know, GEMA, like, um, you know, ASAP or AAP, whatever your group is that you, um, your professional organization, they have a lot of people working in the global health space, um, especially if you're an academic. So, you know, you can move towards, you know, move in those directions, meet people, find out what they're doing. Um, if you, there's other groups like International Federation for Emergency Medicine, um, if you're working in Africa, on the continent of Africa, you can do the African Federation for Emergency Medicine. So these are all groups that are, um, oh yeah, thanks for putting in that. 
Um, these are all groups that I've been involved with. I think many of us have been involved with before. And so I would just, you know, um, find these people and really put yourself out there. That's fantastic advice. And I would just echo what um, Dr. Chen was saying, because you don't know what you don't know in global health. And if you would have asked me when I was like a medical student, I'm like, oh yeah, global health. So I will go and I will um, take care of patients um, where they need me. And right now, well, actually, even when I actually really started getting my, um, finding myself in my groove in global health and finding myself really starting to enjoy global health, it had nothing to do with clinical care. Like I haven't taken care of a patient internationally in over 10 years um, because I didn't even realize, oh, education is really where it's, it's at for me. Um, and as I learned more about things like humanitarian work and about research um, and about um, capacity building, I was like, oh, okay, there's just so many other facets that I didn't even know about. But what I was thinking about was with global health was just this tiny little part of it that has absolutely nothing to do with what I do with global health today. Um, so I think that was a great point that she brought up. Um, yes, thank you for both for sharing. And I also would take this moment to also do a plug for please join SAM, our PEM, GEMA group, because we would love to have you as one place to find out more information. And then um, Dr. Nsarenko, would you like to um, reflect on the time you were most vulnerable and how you navigated it? Yeah, I think I felt most vulnerable after training. You know, I, I finished my PEM fellowship probably the longest of anybody ago. So I was the first in my department, which may be the same for a lot of you who wanted a career in this. And so when I graduated, you know, I had actually done successful work. I even had some grant funding to protect time when I finished fellowship. The biggest problem I faced was my colleagues all thought I was on vacation. Um, like, oh, where did you just come back from? Like I was in Maui, you know? Um, definitely not the case. And so, so I actually had a, to do a real internal education campaign about what I was doing and how difficult it was. Um, and so I think one of the things I had a really great mentor teach me was to have my elevator pitch. Um, my 30 second, you know, cause you know, I'd be in the department, people would be excited to see me that I've been away for a month or a week or two weeks or whatever. And they'd say, oh, you know, where are you just coming back from? And instead of saying, oh yeah, I just came back from Liberia. I would say, oh, you know, in Liberia, I just came back, we were implementing a new cash program, or, you know, we just did this teaching um, for all the trauma surgeons in Ukraine. And so now, you know, it, it was really hard, I think Alicia put this in the chat, to like self promote initially, because I didn't want this like, you know, I didn't want to portray a white savior complex, Mother Teresa, like global health, because that's not who we are. But at the same time, if my colleagues think I'm on vacation, then that's a problem too. So it was finding a happy medium of educating my colleagues and them. And then it was also navigating the schedule. So even though I had grant funding, you know, for some of my time, you know, trying to make sure that I didn't blip the schedule, that nobody felt that there was more burden of shifts or more burden of different types of shifts because I was gone even though it would have been perceived and not real. Um, I think it's it can be really challenging if you're the first one doing it in a department. And so I feel like it took like two to three years to flip the switch for instead of people asking me when they saw me, oh, where did you just get back from? Asking me, oh, what are you working on now? Um, and so it was this like sh shift in culture. Um, so I think that was that was probably the time I felt most vulnerable. And I think and an unrelated echoing of what Carol said, um, global health world is super small. It's super small within PEM. It's small within emergency medicine and it's small within medicine and people really know each other. And so the networking is really important, but I think the follow through is super important. And so take on what you know you can do and really be honest with yourself, you know, is this the phase of my life where my partner wants me home more than away? Is this the phase of my life where I'm having kids? Is this the phase of my life where I have an older parent? 
um, it's really important to just be realistic about what you can do. Like your career is your career. And, you know, I think medicine is super judgy and we're always looking and saying, oh, am I doing enough? Am I like, which is, you know, at the end of the day, you're doing enough if you are happy, in my opinion. And so, so I think that it's a really, it's an important thing to be, to really think for yourself of what's going to keep you going for the next 20 to 30 years. And I think in our field of PEM where burnout is high, especially right now, and I don't know when this patient context is going to change, um, we have to be thinking about how do we preserve ourselves for the next 20 to 30 years as, you know, early career people. And I think having a balance of global health, which is an outlet and our clinical work is really important. That can also be a sell to your chiefs. Everybody wants a solution to burnout, FYI. And this is like a tangible solution, right? You're doing something productive and academic. It's promoting wellness and it's tangible and they can count it and measure it and report on it. Um, so we've had some success on that in a couple of different locations and partners. So also a way to market it. Fantastic. And then Dr. Gonzalez, would you like to share? Sure. Um, so I am um, the juniorest of junior people on this uh, faculty panel, um, but I feel like I actually have to echo what a, a lot of the other panelists have said in terms of their point of most uh, feeling most vulnerable, which is really that transition from like being a trainee to being a faculty member. I think um, the last couple of years is probably the time that I felt most vulnerable. For me, that coincided with uh, a global pandemic and that was quite challenging to navigate what was gonna become of my global health career when um, travel was uh, really um, squashed. And, and that really forced me to do a, a complete pivot in terms of thinking about um, what my priorities were. And so I pivoted in a couple of different ways. Um, I pivoted um, to actually joining SAEM, which is another uh, plug for the organization. And I also pivoted um, to thinking more about um, research and policy. Um, I actually had a conversation with Alicia, who I'm not sure that she remembers this, but I actually had a very important conversation with Alicia that actually kind of um, uh, gave me the impetus to actually kind of progress in the trajectory that I'm currently I'm currently on, and I was able to um, really leverage some relationships. And this is a this is a you know recurring theme that everyone's talking about: relationships, networking, um, building those relationships to actually kind of uh, build on opportunities and saying yes to opportunities that um, were really important. I have to echo what um, Michelle and Carol and everyone else has all also said about kind of uh, the opportunity and saying yes to opportunities. I will say that um, simultaneously, it's really important to know what type of global health person you are because they're, we're talking about it as if it's one thing, but it's really so many different things. So, you know, some folks are really interested in medical education. And for me, I'm not interested in that. Some people are interested in you know, humanitarian health and that's much more my speed. Some people are interested in, in kind of health systems building and that is that is also something that's kind of my speed. And so if for me, it was really just kind of a, an understanding of what actually speaks to me and finding that tribe of people to actually really do the work that you're really interested in doing. So I said yes to things. I said yes to a lot of things. I said no to things that really didn't jive with what I was fundamentally interested in. And I think that during that period of vulnerability for me, it was really also, again, going into yourself to try to figure out what are your strengths and actually leveraging those strengths um, to get the get the opportunities, get the outcomes that you really want. And so for me, I found that a strength was to build those relationships and what was to actually kind of uh, build community of, of individuals who are kind of interested in common activities. And so um, this seminar is definitely kind of part of that process. It's like, it's definitely been um, amazing to be able to have a vision, talk to people who share that vision and then actually go and get stuff done. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks to all the panelists for sharing. I think um, that uh, one, one just thing I want to reflect on is for any trainees on the call as well, I think that it can be very difficult to find a space to practice global emergency medicine while you're a trainee and finding ways that you can still doing that, do that while you're a resident or while you're in medical school can be challenging. 
but just thinking about, you know, COVID has opened so many new doors. And I think some of the things that people have mentioned, you know, find the places you're passionate about, say yes to things, learn from, you know, different um, advisors, learn from the people on these panels and, and try to just figure out where your space is and what you could contribute. So, um, so I just wanna, before we move forward, um, just ask a question that was coming up in the chat, but also to kind of reflect in a little bit of a bigger way. So um, the question is whether a fellowship is necessary in pediatric emergency medicine or global health or both. Um, and maybe for those who would also like to reflect, how did they prepare for a career in PEM and global health as a, as a last question as we kind of wrap up this um, webinar, maybe. Um, uh, Michelle, you would like to go first, since I think you may have some experience in this question. Yeah, it's a great question. I think to kind of unpack the layers of it, you know, if you're a resident and you're a resident in pediatrics, you have to think about, and you're interested in the emergency care space, I think you have to kind of self-assess and think about your residency. And if you learned enough pediatric emergency care to feel comfortable in that space, and then globally who your audience is, you know, so if it's a, a space that is going to be asking for high procedure volumes or, you know, sort of different levels of training. Um, if you're an emergency medicine physician, you know, you come with the higher acuity, higher procedure skills, but maybe not that pediatric specific audience. A little bit is who controls pediatrics in the global world and who controls emergency medicine in the global world. And it really varies by country, region, oversight body. Um, and, you know, Pete's emergency medicine doesn't have its own home per se. Um, you know, sometimes it falls under pediatrics, sometimes it falls under emergency medicine. Unfortunately, it occasionally falls under surgery, which is not a good plan. Sorry if there's any surgeons on the call. Um, <laughs> that's how it is. So, so I think thinking about who your target audience of work is, and what credibility you're going to have to have, real or perceived, right? Like we all know that any of us could be an excellent clinician with or without formal training. The question will be sometimes credentials and access to funding or things based on credentials. So from a, just the PEM clinical perspective, um, you know, the question of PEM versus ID, you know, infectious disease, obviously it's had its like limelight for 40 years since the HIV epidemic started in the 80s. Um, I think ID has gone a lot of the way of clinical research and is a very heavy grant funded space. And so if you're doing infectious disease, you want, you would have to be thinking about being on the grant funded research pathway. And so if that is not your pathway, um, it's a little bit harder to crack into the technical advisory space because there's so much grant funded people out there. PEM, on the other hand, we're brand new. And so some of us do research, some of us do education, some of us do implementation. We have a strong public health interface. You know, the ER, we are the front door of the hospital, the health center, the clinic, the health system. And so that public health interface, which then leads me to think about, you know, a PEM Global Health Fellowship versus not, I think some of this depends on what skills you're looking for. You know, I think at this level, we're really truly adult learners. And so if you feel like you need a diploma in tropical medicine, because you're working in a highly sort of tropical medicine environment, if you feel like public health, like I need to do large scale evaluations, I want to work in the surveillance space, I want to work in the um, response space, maybe public health, maybe it's um, more humanitarian response based course, maybe it's methodology. So sometimes a fellowship is a means to getting that paid for. Um, we run a lot of fellowships and the main reason we call things fellowship is it avoids taxes. And so we can pay for it for people without having to pay taxes. That's literally why we do it. And so, so sometimes a fellowship is a means to an end for money savings. Um, it also is then if you're thinking about a job where you're begging for protected time and you're cramming in 10, 12, 14 shifts a month to get two weeks off here and there, how heavy that workload is versus a slightly reduced salary to then have free time for two or three years to try to build up funding. You know, these are, I think, as, um, as Amber said, you have to choose for you. And so trying to learn about what are the benefits of each one of these things? What are the cons? 
and then trying to build your trade-offs for money, time. I once had a great logistician who told me you can do anything with enough people, money, and time. And so you've got to figure out what your three-legged stool of people, money, and time looks like, and you're the person. So I think I'm just going to come in for one second because I think that's great advice. Um, I have definitely told folks who I think would be great emer pediatric emergency medicine physicians not necessarily to do it because their interests are actually different. And I think uh, one thing that I, I think I'm still preparing for a career in PEM Global Health, so I don't know that I have the answer for that. But I think what I did do very intentionally a couple years ago is really look at what I wanted to do, be, achieve, and then work backwards to look at the skills and skills credentialing um, and experiences that I would need to get to that place. And I think there is a there is definitely like this real versus perceived benefit for being fellowship trained, and that's something that you have to individually weigh out. But um, but I think the most important thing is actually what do you want to do, and what are the skills like the hard skills that you actually need. Those might be clinical skills, those might be research skills, implementation, etc. I think the 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 plug that I would put in for EM. I think that, like Michelle said, we are the we are the entryway to society's ills, and um, we have a very strong overlap with public health. And I think one thing, like over the course of my fellowship, I think I've increasingly seen myself more as an emergency medicine physician than a pediatrician. And I think the part of the reason that that transition has come into effect for me is that I really think about the healthcare system, and I think emergency medicine physicians are probably a little better at looking at the systems of care because our, our specialty is organized in terms of timeliness, in terms of a location, and in terms of undifferentiated presentations instead of necessarily like an age population or so on. So there's something I think that um, lends EM to a certain set of skills and experiences. And if that's for you, then it's the right career path. But if it's not for you, then I think you have to look at something else. Fantastic. Does anyone yeah, and I just want to jump in real quick and just echo what's been said. Um, I think the answer to the question about if you need to do a global health fellowship, I think again, like we talked about, it kind of depends on what you're looking for um, and what skills you want to get out of it. So I did it knowing that I wanted more hands-on clinical. I want to be like boots on the ground working um, in different settings. And that's definitely what I got out of it. Like I came into it already having a master's in public health, already having like the, that background. Um, but I will say that again, Global Health Fellowship isn't necessarily absolutely mandatory. I'll just hear Dr. Janiska did not do the PIM Global Health Fellowship. She has tons of international experience. She is a like global health doctor extraordinaire. Um, and she trained at the same place that myself, Diola and Carol did. But and she still has a fabulous career in global health. So it's not a necessity. I, again, I think it's just look at, I think what Denise is perfect, look at what you want to be doing and then work backwards and see like well, where and what areas do you want to get more experience um, in and then work that way. But there's no one size fits all path to, to PIM global health. And I think just also remembering, as Michelle said, PIM is a very new field in general and it doesn't exist in some places of the United States. Um, let alone internationally, emergency medicine is also relatively young. So I will tell you, working clinically, like in, in Malawi, a lot of what I did was hospital medicine. A lot of what I did was like critical care medicine. I think that PIM was perfect because I was comfortable doing, you know, initial resuscitation, seeing very sick kids and stabilizing. But I definitely had to flip my brain and be like, oh my God, it's day three and I'm still looking at the same child. This is called rounding. And this is what I was trying to avoid by doing PIM. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and having to remember some like neonatal stuff too, where it was like, my calculating calorie growths now, like what is happening to me? Um, but just know that global health is all about being flexible. So I think really just think about what it is that you're looking for and what you want to do. And, and then you can work backwards from there. I think that was perfect advice. Fantastic. The same experience in Ghana. Would anyone else like to, to share before we wrap up on this question? Yeah, I just had 100% everything everyone said. I just want to add one piece is um, from my own perspective, I actually took five years between, I worked for five years between residency and fellowship. So my point just being there that it's, you know, it's not a race. You can, you know, you may not feel like you know the answer now and that's okay. You don't have to know exactly what you want to do right away at every step. So if you need to take some time, I'm not sure I would recommend taking five years, but 
you know, if you need to take some time, it is okay. Things will be there for you when you come back. And if it's not fellowship, I think Deal will put in some things in the chat about like there's certificates and there's shorter track things you can do. So, so don't feel rushed. Like you got to make a decision right away. You, you do have some time. Fantastic. Dr. Jessica, would you like to help with the wrap up? Sure. So first of all, I would like to say thank you so very much to this amazing panel of people who I very much admire. Thank you so much for your time today. I think um, you've all shared such great life experience and great advice about having a career in PEM and global emergency medicine. Um, my hope to our wider audience is that you will sign up for a lot of the different um, academic organizations um, that I have thrown in their uh, websites in the um, in the chat. So please take a moment to take a, a look at them. I know that we're not going to be able to answer everyone's questions today, um, but this is giving us ideas for other webinars that we can do specifically for PEM and global health, um, perhaps having a webinar talking about preparing yourself for a PEM, um, PEM fellowship or PEM global health fellowship, um, something to look forward in, uh, in the future. And then repeating this panel again, perhaps with different panelists, just to get a wider um, idea of what the types of um, what types of career path there are for everyone. Um, so I highly encourage you all to reach out to SAEM, to GEMA, to ASAP International, IFEM, AFEM, all of the AAPs, this, um, section on global health. Um, please, we're all out here. We are, I, I think we are all get excited about talking about our different careers because they're so different. There are so many different pathways to get into this. So please um, let us know. Um, if this panel was worth your time today, if you'd like to hear um, about more about what we do. Um, so again, just a great, great thanks to our amazing panelists here today. Um, thank you all so very, very much. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and with that, we'll conclude. This is being recorded. And so um, this will be on the SAM GEMA website and available for all. So if you know folks who are interested in being here today and participating and aren't able to, um, they can find it on the SAM GEMA website as well. Thank you all so very, very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye all. Thank you all so much. Thanks.